Well, probably the most important thing to think um, is typology. This is something that got completely lost um, in the West. I mean, there's, there, there are vague remnants of it in Roman Catholicism, but um, in Protestantism, it's completely, almost completely absent in their, in their approach to the scriptures, although it's essential to the scriptures themselves. Um, it's used throughout the scriptures. It's used in the Old Testament. It's used in the New Testament. Um, it's, it's one of the most important internal ways that the scripture uh, uh, holds together. Um, and that's that it, it um, you, have, you have the type, the antitype, and, and the archetype, hmm. which is eschatological. is historical, this is present. The other thing that is, that is you know, essential to the Orthodox understanding <clears throat> is the idea and the experience of that, well, and based on, on the whole based on the incarnation, but um, it was present before the incarnation, that matter can be sanctified and that matter can bear holiness and convey holiness. Um, and this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is completely absent in Protestantism. Um, in Protestantism, you don't have holy things. There's, no, there's nothing that is, no thing that is holy. And even the, you know, people throw around the Bible and, you know, put it on the floor, even though it's, you know, supposedly they're great. It's kind of the great sacrament, the last sacrament of Protestantism. Um, but uh, it's, uh, they don't have the idea that, that matter itself becomes sanctified. Now for us, um, and, and this, is, this is the basic principle of theosis. Or deification. When Jesus was incarnate, uh, he united humanity to his divinity and and became a uh, became a particular man. And yet, who he was was the incarnate Son of God. Now, his humanity was fully human. He was fully human as we are. Uh, his divinity was absolute and complete. He was not half God and half man. He was fully God and fully man. Um, but his humanity was deified. And, it, and it ultimately, is, we see the ultimate deification of his nature um, at, the, uh, at his resurrection, the ascension. And when he comes again uh, in glory to... Uh, to judge the living and the dead, he manifests that deification of his nature. In the meantime, um, as when he, uh, when he took flesh and became a man, um, his humanity was, 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 was completely, was deified. Um, I think you could say um, he lived in a human mode of being, um, in a biolog you know, in a biological human mode of being where um, of, of the sanctification and deification of his humanity, whereas in the resurrection he's living according to a divine mode of being, um, with the deification of his of his humanity, his his divinity was humanized and his humanity was divinized. Um, this principle of theosis is at the very core and it's the essence of all Orthodox theology. Um, it, uh, from the incarnation uh, to the uh, to our idea of salvation, because the whole point of salvation is that is that we are in the process of being united to God and uniting ourselves to God by the grace of the Holy Spirit, 
and our and our very humanity itself is being deified. That's why we have the relic, the incorrupt relics of the saints. That's why we have, you know, um, and this is where the sacraments are are, are rooted in. Um, uh, that the, the bread and wine of the Eucharist, the water of baptism, the oil of chrism, um, and so forth, uh, it bears the grace and the presence of God within it. And so that, and these are means of becoming, of, not of sanctifying us. The goal of the Eucharist is not that the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Christ. The goal of baptism is not that the water becomes um, the, the very uh, manifestation of God, uh, the goal of, of uh, the consecration of the, the goal of chrism is not that the chrism itself um, is sanctified. It's, it's the fruit of that. It's that because by eating the body and blood of Christ, we become partakers. We, we, we become the body of Christ. By being anointed with the chrism, we are anointed with the Holy Spirit and, the, and um, through that anointing with the chrism, <clears throat> by being immersed in the waters of baptism, we are immersed in, threefold into God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the water itself becomes the type or the antitype of, uh, of, of death and of resurrection. So uh, you spoke a little bit about Christ deified human nature, and you mentioned that he was maybe on this earth when he was walking around deified biologically. Can you distinguish, you know, a few different things from us? One, what what that uh, means with regard to basically like from his incarnation to like kind of walking around. Then at the transfiguration, like what's the difference in the, the deified human nature then and the, which he was normally walking around? Then the difference between that and his post-resurrection state, and then that and I think one of the prayers says, um, like by ascending into the heavens, you did, thou didst deify the flesh that thou didst assume. So it links it to the ascension as well. So can, do you mind just like, it, I, I don't understand what the, the exact differences are in these states. Well, the, the difference is is that <clears throat> in his um, uh, in his life on earth, Jesus lived as a human being, just like we do. But who he was is the incarnate Son of God. He 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 uh, he was he fully. Had a, he had a full the fullness of the of the divine nature, the fullness of the God had dwelt in him bodily, as Saint Paul says in, in Colossians, right? Um, but that did not impede his being human. He was human in every way that we are, except for sin. And in fact, people didn't notice a whole lot about him other than that he said strange things, you know. Uh, that attracted them, that sounded right and true and things like that. Um, uh, and then he did things like heal the sick and he raised the dead and, you know, which are manifestations of his divinity. They're signs of his divinity. All the miracles are signs of who he was. Um, but, uh, but he lived and appeared and, um, uh, act and was mortal like we are to the point of accepting even to be um, condemned tortured and crucified and murdered um, it, you know it's not you know there's a um, uh, I think there, there are two te there are two temptations historically in Christology one is to go the Monophysite route, where where Jesus only really appear, only only appears to be human. Okay, and that's kind of Docetism. That was that was one of the earliest heresies, um, and it's an, a heresy addressed in the Bible, um, and that's why Saint John begins his epistle. That which we have seen with our eyes, which we have touched, we, you know, with our hands, we, you know the. 
who's the word of life. That's why it makes such, and well, Jesus was truly human being in every way that we are, except for sin. And so that says a lot about human nature. <clears throat> means that you can be human and not sin. Because Jesus did that. Who he was is the Son of God incarnate. What he was is both God and man. So before the resurrection, he was living um, from his birth until his resurrection, from his, from his conception until his resurrection, he lived a, a very human life, right? Totally human life. Um, and the whole point was that he assumed our humanity in every aspect, including to grow from being a, a fetus to a child, to an infant, to a child, to a teenager, to, you know, to a fully grown man. But he also, he also assumed um, you know all of the, con the all of the conditions of of our uh, of our life, and so he 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 got hungry, he got thirsty, he got tired, he, you know, and so on and so forth. So Jesus was Jesus was a real man. The um, now the temptation with that is the Nestorian temptation to say that well he was a man that had a special relationship with God. No, he was God incarnate. Who he was, and his, in other words, the low, his hypostasis, the, the very uh, core of his being was the Son of God, is the Logos of God, um, which took flesh as the man Jesus. The Nestorian, so the Nestorian temptation goes too far on the humanity the Benalphazite goes too far uh, on the divinity. It minimizes the humanity, whereas the Nestorian um, uh, over, overstates the humanity. Um, uh, Father George Florosky called it anthropological minimalism and anthropological maximalism, if you want theological sounding language. Um, Jesus in his uh, in his humanity in his in his life on earth was as, as fully deified in other words he 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 lived in in perfect um, synergy with with the father right um, in his not only in his divinity but in his humanity because he was one person the son of god incarnate and that shows what how human nature, what, what, how human nature was uh, created to be, and the possibility of how it can be lived. Now, in his in his resurrection, there was a there was a radical difference. On one hand, Thomas could come and put his his fingers in the in the prints of the nails in his hands. He could put his his hand into into the Lord's side. No Not, but you know. So and. And he ate and he drank and, you know, on one and and the women, the women could okay. come up and hug him um, as they did. And they, you know, he was he, there. His, but he wasn't constrained by time and space. He could be he could be with the apostles at the same time as he was on the road with with Luke and Cleopas. As and uh, we had there's one of the hymns, Apostle hymns. Uh, he was in the tomb with the body and in hell with the soul and paradise with the thief and on the throne with the Father and the Holy Spirit, all at the same time. In fact, we would say that he never left the throne of the Father, um, even to become incarnate. Um, he was always with the Father and the Holy Spirit. The incarnation was a special, unique, Thing for us and for our salvation, it's the economy of salvation. But by by taking our flesh, he sanctified it. He filled it with the divinity, and he showed us what it means to live as a human being who is who's who is sanctified. 
in his resurrection, he shows what the ultimate eschatological state of our humanity is, which is shining with and radiant with the uncreated light and coming on the um, coming on the clouds of heaven. You look at the ascension icon, right? And you can't tell whether he's coming or going. And that's that's per, that's on purpose uh, because the angels said to the apostles, as you see him going, you will see him coming again. So the ascension is also, it's a, it's a type of the second coming. Um, uh, the, the transfiguration is a type of the, of the resurrection. It's a, it's a manifestation beforehand um, of, uh, to the apostles of Christ's um, divinity and, and, of, and of the, radi the radiance of human nature uh, deified, um, which their eyes were opened to be able to see. Because they, their noetic eyes were open, so that they could see the transfiguration of Christ. It's not. It's not like everybody uh, could see Jesus shining up on the mountain. It's Peter, James, and John saw Jesus radiant on the mountaintop. Um, and uh, so, uh, at the second coming, we ex he will be. Uh, he will be like he was when he when he ascended, but coming in coming on the on the clouds uh, with the ranks of angels, you know, surrounded by by the by the hosts of heaven. Um, so it's so there's a, rather of a, of a of a difference, um, but he will be in his humanity, but his humanity as he is now on the throne with the Father, having ascended into the heavens, whatever that is, whatever that means, nobody knows what it means, okay? And, you know, I mean, it's, it's not, it's outside of, 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 of this, um, it's outside of this universe. It's a parallel universe, if you want to use that kind of language. It's outside of time and space. Um, um, and it's outside of the material realm. Um, and yet, in his humanity, in his human body, he ascended uh, to the throne of the Father and is seated there with the Father. He's enthroned with the Father. And so, you know, that's where, that's where after the crucifixion narrative in the Gospel of John, you pick up in Revelation chapter 5. Chapter 4 and 5, yeah. So is the assumption then that uh, in heaven... Or in the presence of God, Christ will always be manifest to those. Yeah, because Christ is the great high priest who sits enthroned with the Father and the Spirit um, and will be the light of, of the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. Yeah. So the way I was taught as a Catholic was simply that Jesus, after the resurrection, chose to show, just chose to walk through walls, but he could have done that all along. Are you saying something different than that? Uh, yes. Okay. That he was really limited. He was really he okay. he was a human being just like you and I. Okay. But he did like teleport before the resurrection, didn't he? <laughs> no. In the, in the John, where he's like he's giving a sermon on the shore, and then suddenly he's in a boat out on the water. Um, and it literally says that it you know just shifts position. Mm -hmm. I'm dubious. Uh, right, but yeah. maybe that's how the part is. I think you can and read it because, you know, like, for example, like when he was surrounded by a hostile crowd and he passed through them, I mean, yeah. there were some ways in which he could do things that were very unique or maybe other people's eyes were hidden or something like that, but it wasn't the same as after he was. No, it was, a, it, was, it was a totally different mode of being. Wherever he is now, after having ascended, plus where presumably Enoch and Elijah are, and his mother as well. And all the saints, angels and saints. Well, but the other saints are not risen with their bodies. But he is, mm -hmm. and Elijah and, and Enoch, 
mm -hmm. the lives of the bodies, and presumably the mother of God also, her body is assumed that there's some place material. I don't know how you know, is it in this universe, but there's got to be a material aspect to it. From our, from our perspective, this, uh, it's uh, before the general resurrection. In eternity, there's no before and after. That's 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 how Jesus appeared to Moses, you know, and showed and showed his back to Moses. That's how Jesus walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, it's the Lord, and it was it was the Son of God incarnate in his pre in a pre incarnation appearance, but his but he's outside of time and space. So it was it was he who wrestled with with Jacob. You know, that was, you know, all the all the Old Testament theophanies um, are of of Yahweh, the Son of God, um, and so um, and in his human and in in his human form, why? How did God have human form? The incarnation. Is the name Yahweh given to? Equal parts, like all of like the entire Trinity, or is that yeah. given specifically to? It's the person like, of the Son. The Son, okay. Because I've only ever heard as like the angel of the Lord is Jesus, but Yahweh is attributed to everyone. I've heard the, the Father's not Yahweh. Other no. people say that. The Father, the, the, the Father is God Almighty. <laughs> Is Yahweh God Almighty? Okay. Well, okay. well in a sense, in a sense, they all, all are because there's they, but there's but there are three. Now you never, you never, you, you you see the Holy Spirit called the Lord, Adonai, um, but Adonai is usually what is substituted for Yahweh in in Hebrew. But very specifically, at least according to the scholarship that I read, read you know I've read, you've got God the Father Almighty that the that Jesus revealed <laughs> God as the Father, that he is the Son of God who is Yahweh, and and there is the Holy Spirit, um, the three. What does Yahweh mean? Is it just like a, sort of like a, a giant being? I am. I am boy. And so it was a, it was a revelation of Yahweh in, in the Old Testament. As the God, of, as who is the God of Israel. So just to be clear, like the distinction between the transfiguration and just his normal mode of existence, you said that it was in fact not that. Well, you didn't say this, but this is my question. So you did say that it was that the disciples, their eyes were open to be right. able to see. But my question is. Was there an actual change in Christ's state, or is it just that their eyes were open to see his actual his radiance that was always there? I think people could just see. It? Well, I think I think it's that their eyes were open. So he didn't actually have any change in state. It was just that their eyes were open. Although it says, although the word <clears throat> he was transfigured before them means that he was transformed. Now. Was it their perception that he was transformed, or was it, or was their perception transformed? So, so that, so that they could, could behold his, the illumination of, in, you know, of his. So there's, there's no like clear answer. It's like it could be, maybe a transformation, but, but maybe not. There's no clear answer to that, basically. I don't know. Okay. You have to look it up. Um, dogmatically, um, well, you, I mean, you would certainly, you would certainly say that, you know, that uh, for those who had the eyes to see, he would always, he would always be transfigured. It would always be radiant with the uncreated light, um, but nobody had their eyes opened. Right. Yeah. At that point, 
Yeah. What about the the forerunner in the in the womb, and then the the, the priest who? Right. Well, there were those who did have their eyes opened by God, who were, um, and so it was it was John the Baptist, it was Simeon, yeah. it was um, Mary, the mother of God. Um, you know, they, uh, Peter. You know, Peter, James, and John. They they beheld his glory. Um, and that's what it, that's what the radiance, seeing the radiance of God means. It's it's to behold His glory. So I have a follow up to that about um, Saint Seraphim. Uh huh. So the story of him radiating the uncreated light is that that the, the, his disciple had his eyes open. Mm-hmm. Ah. And Saint Seraphim told him that unless you two were shining like as I my unless. You, you were shining like I myself am, uh, you wouldn't be able to see me like this. In other words, it takes that um, illumination of soul to be able to perceive the radiance of the uncreated light. Someone recently told me that, this is sort of related to that story, uh, someone went up to some monastery and they were really excited because they sort of like they were at some icon and the icon was sort of smelling very sweet, very pleasant. And so they're like, you know, being very excited to one of the monks and he's like, wow, like look at this, this icon it smells so great. And he's like, yeah, like they all smell like this. Like, why is this like a big deal to you? And the guy's like, what do you mean they all smell like this? Like they're always like this. You just don't know it. In that sense of like it's always going through. Well, part of, part of this is gets back to the whole idea of deification. And of the transformation that happens in us by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Now, the word repentance, uh, we think repentance means feel guilty and beat yourself up, right? Generally, that's not what repentance means. It's Meta and noia, nous, and and so <clears throat> Romans twelve, uh, twelve two. The 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 sentence begins with the word, be transfigured. Metamorphose in the renewal and decanison of your news. Metamorphosis means trans- transformation, be transfor- or transfigurations. What the word we use for transfiguration is metamorphosis. Be transfigured in the renewal of your noose. In other words, let your let your uh, spiritual eyes be transformed. Let your con- noose also means consciousness. Let your consciousness be transformed. Be transformed in the renewal of your consciousness. And that's what repentance means. And so when you, uh, this whole process of, that we see in the saints, of the process of deification, or theosis, is, and, and that we can see even in ourselves, you know, as we go through the um, the ascent to spiritual awareness, is this opening up of our of our consciousness, and um, so uh, and especially through the Jesus prayer and through contemplative prayer. Now, <clears throat> this uh, and th- this was actually what the main kind of thing I'd wanted to get into tonight, but I'd, how late do you guys want to go? All the way. Yeah. Ooh.
Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so is it fair to say that the Protestants, in the sense of how they view the matter as unholy, right? Thank you very much. Is that fair to say that they view, you were saying the Protestants don't think of the matter as being able to be sanctified? Well, there's an aspect of, uh, you know, part, coming out of Augustine, who was raised a, a Gnostic, or who lived many years as a Gnostic, a Manichaean, um, uh, it wasn't. It wasn't that matter was neutral. So matter was evil, you know, and because everything was dual, was in dualistic categories. So yeah, that was probably, Eastern probably, Eastern yeah. Eastern Christianity doesn't use does not use dualistic categories. We use non-dual categories. But you see, you can say Protestantism in that in that line of thought is a renewal of Gnosticism. In a sense, yeah. And because, also, yeah, and also monos monophysites are kind of Gnostic too. Or... Um, actually, the Nestorians are actually more Gnostic. Um, well, both of them are. Yeah, because they're, they're also right. to be dualistic. This was the essential roots of Gnosticism, is this dualistic thinking. Now, it also is at the heart of August, Augustine's thinking. And you know, and and you know, and so so many of Augustine's arguments, which became the root and the foundation of almost all of Western theology, are rooted in dualism. It's funny because it's at the root of Jacques Derrida's thinking too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it's just one more form of rationalism. Yeah. You know, it doesn't. It's not a. Uh, um, it's, it's nothing unusual, you know. Um, but take, for example, the Trinity. You can't understand it rationally, right? Because you can't divide it into dualistic categories. Now, the Filioque does that. The Filioque turned the Trinity into, into two dualistic pairs. There's the Father-Son, which are a dualistic opposition. And then there's the Father, Son, and the Spirit, or rather the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And, and, there's, and there's an ontological precedence of, of the Father, Son over the Spirit, right? Because, and the Spirit's personhood is in fact impinged in that theology. Um, that's, that's one of the reasons why the filioque is a heresy. It, it fundamentally distorts everything um, so not to get stuck in this um, I don't want to drive us too far sideways but could I ask a question while we're on the Trinity yeah. about something that does directly with the Bible so Rinsky says something weird that I, did, I didn't really understand about uh, the Trinity like existing in, in relation to equality to one another and only in, in Trinity what? Existing in a, uh, in relative equality to one another, right? And only organizing itself into sort of a hierarchy in relation to additional. Well, he says hypostases, but he doesn't mean it in the same sense as the Trinitarian hypostasis. Well, you would say, we would say that uh, there is a hierarchy in the Trinity, in that in that the Father is the source of the Son and the Spirit, um, and so the uh, uh, the Father is the source of all things. And uh, the son and the and, and he is the one and the father is the one God with his son and his spirit. Maybe I just didn't understand what you were saying. I, yeah, I it's yeah. Back and read it. But you know okay. the problem is we're, we have to deal in rational categories, right. and rational categories are all dualistic. Sorry, uh, can you just explain one more time uh, your explanation of you know why you know the dualist dualism between the father and the son like the dualistic position and then how the can you just explain that one more time for me how is there a dualistic opposition yeah like can you just explain you said like the dualistic opposition then you said the um you know subordination of the third person the tree, the well yeah the, so can you just well, explain that again it, 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 because in with the filioque yeah so do you have a car 
Oh, okay. Okay. We'll see you back at the ranch. Um, you off to it? Yeah. All right. Um, with the Filioque, you have the, the uh, father um, who is the source of uh, the son and the son, or, uh, and the uh, and the spirit, but the son is also a source of the spirit. So, um, so what that does is it messes up the hypostatic characteristics of the of of the persons. The father is the source of all. It's called the monarchy of the father, um, who has who uh, the son comes from forth from him, begotten by him, and the spirit comes forth from him. Um, but the son and the spirit are, are equal, and they're equal and equal with the father, and, and they're they're three. Yet there's there's a unity because the, because of their fundamental unity of coming from coming from the father. Oh, Father Trinum goes into that a little bit. Yeah, in the book, doesn't he? He says something like uh, he calls it a heresy because the teaching of the early church was that if there's any distinction between the hypostases, it's the property of one hypothesis. Right? There's no property. Like, uh, well, all if I, all properties have to be equally shared. The father, the property of the father is that he is the source of the son and the spirit. The property of the son is that he is begotten by the father. The property, right. the, defi the hypostatic characteristic of the spirit is that he is uh, he comes forth from the father. Right. Okay. Uh, that and maybe rests in the son, but he's but it's a. Those are the defining, those are the fundamental definitions of their personhood. If you add the filioque to it, it messes all that up. Because it starts to collapse the distinction between Christ and God the Father. Right. And so instead of Father, Son, and Spirit, you have Father, Son, And spirit. Except that it has to be a single spiration coming down from the love between the Father and Son. Whereas rather than two lines from Father and Son, you have to have a single line right. coming down from the horizontal like a T. Or, right. this, is, this is it. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, right. But it. So they do that for like. To be clever, yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but we don't accept that. That seems like that. We don't accept that. theology. <laughs> yes, <laughs> clever theologians. So, getting getting back to, um, so in a in a system like this, there is no way that you sanctify matter. doesn't work. Calvinism is very dualistic. And in a sense, Calvinism is a, is a much more radically dualistic than Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism within itself, despite itself, maintained some of the balance. Um, but, but Calvinism is, is a kind of rarefied, purified Roman Catholicism, it purified it of all of the Orthodox elements. <laughs> you know, basically. Um, which, which falls through with even, you know, non-denominationalism today. Oh, I mean, yeah. It's just, that's kind of the root of Calvin today in there. And they right. don't even realize it. They, right. they, they disagree with his theology, but they are completely dualistic. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so... And so for us, we don't have, we don't have this, we don't have this opposition. And it's by trying to, and, it, and by forcing orthodox, you know, by forcing theological thought into those cate categories, it, it just doesn't work, it doesn't work. So I started this about Theosis and <clears throat> the renewal of the news. Now, um, so in the fallen state, 
you have This is passable. Passable. In other words, this can change, this cannot, does not change. This is all of this is all of the information from the senses. And and <clears throat> and from um, everything we read here, say all the the emotions, all the feelings all the sensations of the body, everything is processed by the rational mind. The noose perceives God directly and is the real seat of consciousness. This is, this is the level of the ego. And this is the true self. Yeah. Is, is, you said that the noose perceives God directly. Is the noose also, um, can the noose also perceive the angelic beings? Yeah, the perceives angels? spiritual reality. So demons in, as well. They, right. they can act on the noose as well. Mm -hmm. That's how they tempt us uh, invisibly without right. even our knowing it necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but also they, uh, the demons can act on, on the rational mind uh -huh. as well. Um, in the, when we were created, it, uh, the noose was the governing was the governing faculty. In the fall, fallen state. The rational mind becomes the governing faculty. And so, so the task of repentance is to go from this state back to this state, where the noose becomes the governing faculty again. In other words, so that, so that we live according to our true self, And, um, and, and we're totally reintegrated in other words our mind, our rational mind is sanctified through the news, through the perception of God through the, through the presence of God And thus, starting with the mind, deification happens. The, um, and so what opens up in prayer, or the point of prayer, and since we're in this state, not this one, um, is you have to start in the rational mind, but then, then eventually prayer cuts through and becomes noetic. Now this is the, the realm of words. Mm -hmm. This is the realm of silence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, where does the body fit into the noose mind distinction and how does subordinating or taming the body assist with that flipping the, 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 the dominance of the noose in the mind back to where it should be? Well, the rational mind is actually an, a part of the, an aspect of the body. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Like in the brain. <laughs> yeah, it's the brain. Yeah. So, Wait, so, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. No, please. Wait, so you said it's part of the body. Now, the rational mind, you know, we think thoughts, a mind is, contains ideas. So a mind itself can't be material. No, material. it's not. It's the immaterial part of the body. Right. Yes. Okay. Oh, so so what you're saying is that the body is both material and immaterial. And spiritual. Man is a composite being. Uh, okay, so body doesn't just right. refer to matter. It refers to the whole of the... Right. right. 
existence of the person. Right. Okay. Exactly. And then including okay. the noose. Oh wow. Okay. So would you because say you can't. The, the this is the soul. You can't say. Uh, gotcha. yeah. uh, as Florovsky said, a, a soul without a body is a ghost, and a body without a soul is a corpse, and neither one is a human being. Well, yes. So uh, this is now. This is, I guess, why I'm confused because death is the separation of the soul and the body. Right. My understanding is that the soul is the non-physical part of the human being, right. whereas the body is the physical part of the human being. Right. So what happens at death is that the body remains, but the soul departs. Right. So that would seem to indicate that the body does not include, when we say body, it doesn't include material, immaterial, the immaterial aspect. Well, the and, and so there's a, there's a question as to what actually goes on, yeah. Uh, well, wouldn't, wouldn't that just be the distinction between the body and the flesh, though? Because God is, like, body is in the sense of, like, mm. these are the things that we are perceiving things with. Like, whenever when Scripture talks about the eyes, it's not meaning, like, necessarily physical eyeballs. Then there's other ways to see in that sense. Well, there, so there's so is a, there that distinction? Well, there is a distinction between the flesh and the body. Um, but, uh, so, in a sense, I think you could say that body refers to the whole yeah. person, whereas the flesh refers to the meat. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the word for meat, anyway. Flesh, yeah. What? Yeah, so, I guess, yeah, why would, you wouldn't say that, what you're saying is that it's, it, it's incorrect to say that the soul departs from the body at death, rather, what's correct is to say it departs from the flesh at death. Is that a correct way of saying it? Yeah, you could say it, it continues, it has a, there's a spiritual body. Does this make a difference if you view the uh, mind as an aspect of the body or the body as an aspect of the mind? Well, I think you could say the mind is an aspect of the, of the whole person. Okay. Um, yeah, so can you, in really, while we're talking about these words, do you mind also explaining to us what exactly soul and spirit means in relation to, to this, these, uh, to, to rational mind, news, and body? Well, usually this whole thing is referred to as the soul. Okay. The, ration, the rational mind and the news. Which one of those is the spirit then? And uh, then news would be referred to as the spirit. Ah, okay. Body, soul, and spirit. And then the soul also has the insensitive and the um, and the um, irascible aspects. So These, they're, but they're not the parts. Spirit. These aren't parts. The problem with with putting them into a diagram like this is holistic. Is, yeah, is, is we want to make them into parts. Mm -hmm. They're aspects. So they're aspects. Yeah. So can you say that when Adam and Eve gained knowledge of good and evil? They also kind of lost something because the the relationship between the news and the rational mind flipped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where's the where where would where would the knowledge of good and evil be in the rational in the in the news or in the rational mind? I think mm -hmm. you're saying the rational mind. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So like when we're struggling in the corrupted world and we start living the sacramental life and we're struggling with sin and we're always aiming uh, we're always desiring these things that ultimately uh, are. Uh, like fleeting ephemeral mm -hmm. sort of corruption, right? That's more being led by the rational mind. Right. And then when we become, when we start working towards reintegration, and things start to flip, our desires start to find their pro proper target. Right. And that's how it and so and so in, for, uh, yeah, and so and so the whole point is reintegration. Right. Okay, so um, I missed what you said when you were talking about spirit. So can you repeat what you said? What spirit means? Well, the news would be referred to as the spirit. Okay, the news. So reintegration, that would be the chastity, that seven mudri we get in the yeah. prayer. Wholeness, um, wholeness of wisdom. Wholeness of mind, yeah, and I forget what the Greek word is. Um, yeah, I do too. Okay. So in the incarnation, then, Christ lived in that, the second model. The, the, the news has primacy over the mind. Well, Christ would have, yeah, in, in Christ, his, you would, yeah, his, his awareness of God would have 
would have been the controlling factor, mm. which is not only aware, it's intuitive, in, intuitive knowledge of the, of the will of God. So to not sin as a human being, since Christ has deified humanity, would be to have that inversion back to you. Right, to the church to this. The minds of sin to the news. Uh, it makes a lot more sense. Because I've never understood, like, how can humans not sin? Yeah. Now, now, one of the things about this is is that we create a false, the ego, is that we create a false self. And the more, um, dealing with, with this and uh, having a dialogue with one of the brothers, um, dealing with, uh, when, you, when you have trauma, um, and traumatic, especially multiple traumatic incidents called, it's called complex PTSD. Um, uh, the ego becomes compartmentalized, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. What do you mean by that? It's almost like multiple personality. Oh, yeah. if, if you flip back to putting the noose on top, you don't lose the knowledge of putting the ego on top. No, it's everything is is integrated, yeah. and that's the that and that's the whole goal. But it starts to inspire your rational mind, right? Like so, it's, yeah, it inspires the rational. Suddenly, mind. your rational mind starts to direct you towards God, I and mean, that's that's the impetus, the initial impetus for theosis, right? Right. Well, the, that's it. Our, the new and and real eros, for example, is in the noose. It's so funny because I—it's the—it's the, it's the desire for God. I heard Father Porphyrius talk about that about you know our arrows being directed towards God. And, you know, I just—I yeah. didn't understand it at first. You know, just because, no. You know, that something different to me. Yeah. So, Whereas the other passions, they're all in the, they're all in the they're either physical or or they're or they're um, psych, psychological or egotistical. Yeah, yeah. Or egotistical. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're all egotistic. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, sorry for being a little bit behind because I, I did not get like a definition of the body. Like, can you just give like a maybe orthodox? If I was going to look at the orthodox dictionary, this is the body. <laughs> <laughs> this is body. That's body. This is I thought you were saying like body is like everything. It's like the whole human being. Well, it is. It's the whole, it's the whole being. The body includes the rational The body includes the soul. Yeah, the body includes the soul. Uh, otherwise, the, it's a corpse. That's the thing that's a little different. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so can you help me understand, like, um, I mean, it does. so there, there's a couple things that I'm still missing here. Uh, going back again to death being the departure of the soul from the body. So then we said, oh, perhaps what we are meaning to say rather than body is flesh, flesh meaning the right. merely physical components of a human being. But then um, there's this is why I'm also confused is that there's another word, way of using flesh, which refers to basically uh, the fallen, the fallen human nature. Kind mm -hmm. of. So saying you know we need to mortify the flesh. Um, that doesn't mean we need to. If if we were actually taking mortify the flesh in the sense of flesh equals kill the body body then that was literally just mean well that, a lot of people over the course of the centuries have taken it precisely that way the radical ascetics right so what you're saying is that that's actually true what uh no, it's not necessary no it's uh, i some people have taken it that way that's I don't think that's what, like what that means. Yes, a lot of the sex, they thought, yes. they thought suicide was one of the highest things you could do. Yes, exactly. So the soul that, the that's exactly right. So uh, that's like it's it's quite gnostic to basically believe that we need to mortify the physical body, like literally kill the physical body. That's a good thing. That's um, yeah, actually like a gnostic idea. So that's why I'm kind of confused. I want. I'm just trying to figure out what's the distinction then between are we just saying that we now are using flesh in multiple senses, as in flesh for all human nature and flesh for the body, and those are just different senses? Or well, as the uh, in um, as it says in John one, kill logos sarxa genito, and the word became flesh. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's true. 
I also think that uh, we, we have to understand mortify here not as kill, but as, as like deaden. So, um, um, I think that's an important distinction. Yeah, oh, it is. Um, uh, deaden, wait, so I don't know. <laughs> like, like, but yeah, I, I, don't, I still yeah. don't get the distinction. Like, yeah. deaden versus to kill. Like, or. Okay, well, you yeah. can have your tooth nerve deadened, but it's still alive and it still functions, but it's not sending all the same signals. The, the nerve yeah, is still alive. Well, it's because like, it's, it's still it, not. So, it, yeah, okay. At least it's going to be for sure. Is it a difference between, but, you know, like hatred or more, like severe mortification of the body and like sanctifying it? Or? Well, there can be. There, there's, there can be, the two can go together, but for the most part, um, the real sanctification depends on what sanctification is. Um, if if sanctification is in a, is uh, um, obedience to external forms, um, if, uh, if if it's acting holy, um, which is what a lot of uh, external mortification is, right? Um, that's one thing, but does that necessarily translate to the kind of sanctification of theosis? No, because I mean, you can become like, if you think about like Tom Brady, for example, he's like essentially an ascetic, but for football. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? I mean, his, his new sin, his rational mind had it flipped. Well, I mean, I don't know him personally. I mean, maybe he's a very pious guy. But, <laughs> you know, I'm dubious. You know, he I mean, all. you know what I mean, though? I mean, he's, he, he works very, very hard towards that, but he's not. Towards the SSI, I, don't know. Right. I don't even know if that's a useful comment. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Thanks for the indulgence. <laughs> nice so, um, the renewal of the noose. Be transfigured in the renewal of your noose. What does that mean? It means, it means the enlightenment. It means the enlivening. It means the opening up of your noetic awareness. Because noose really, I think, probably one of the best ways to translate it is consciousness. But it's not just your rational consciousness, it's not the consciousness of the brain. It's 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 the spiritual consciousness. It could encompass your subconscious too, then, correct? That the subconscious is, is part of the brain. Because the sub, you know, all of that works with words, concepts, ideas, um, the imagination, the subconscious. The, all of, all of these things are part of the rational mind, even if they're irrational. Mm. So the noose could even guide the senses, right? So the noose eventually guides us, and and what happens in um, as in the process of deification, as one ascends through the phases of purification and illumination, is that um, the uh, the senses eventually become transformed, so that you can see the uncreated light with your own eyes. So that you can see the uncreated light in nature, and then you can be and and on the highest levels you can you can behold God in all things. That's still natural contemplation. Uh -huh. That's still the second level, but the third level is is theolo theology. So uh, yeah, that would be like. Can you talk about that? What you said: first level, <laughs> second level, third level. You know, like. Third level is theology. Uh, so yeah, can you like walk us through these three levels? Yeah, third, that's the kind of theology that you'll never get there by studying. Yes, yes. But like, yeah, can you, oh, maybe what you're saying is that it's not describable. It's, we no, it's absolutely, it's, as, it's beyond all concepts. Yes, so. Uh, and and all expression. Like uh, when people are writing about theology, do they basically just say, like, you're now talking about theology, now we, we
we can't say anything about it? Or do they have like an apophatic way of explaining it? Or what do you want to do? Well, you can only go so far. Right, of course, yeah. It's all, it's, it, that, um, that type of theology is only apophatic. I mean, you, you, you wrote it down that words are the rational mind, right? Right. So it's beyond words. Yeah. It's beyond words. It's beyond images. It's beyond conceptual images. Yeah. It's beyond, it's beyond Im vision. It's beyond, it's beyond anything, anything of, of the rational mind. Would you even describe it as revelation at that point? I, it could be. You could describe it in the terms of revelation. Okay. But the um, but what's one of the things that's interesting enough that I'm trying to one of the reasons I've been thinking about this is you know this discussion I've been having with the uh, with this brother at the monastery um, is how when you have when you have all of this horrific negative experience which which creates this massive complex ego some false self um, how do you break through it because it completely dominates everything. All your thoughts, I mean, it's all, and it's all, it's all thoughts. It's constant, it, when you're constantly in your head, like most 20 year olds, um, it's, you're, you're constantly in your thoughts, right? And, and you can't slow, and you can't silence your mind. Well, the, the whole, the whole, you can't get here until you silence your mind. And so that's why it takes this whole ascetic task to learn how to stop the thoughts or at least not pay attention to the thoughts so that you can, you can move, so that you, you're, you're, you can focus your attention not on the rational mind and its thoughts, but in, in your in the spiritual awareness. So in that sense, or that's kind of the sense in which orthodoxy is similar to Buddhism, or the ascetic practice. I don't think the Buddhists they usually get down there. Well, the, the, I mean, one of the points of the Jesus prayer is not only to pray, obviously, mm -hmm. but to push that other in garbage out. Right, exactly. In a, in a sense, maybe that does have something similar to like a Buddhist koan because that space is occupied. It's, there's words in there that are driving out all the right. chatter. Right. Uh, yeah, whereas there are words don't amount to anything, whereas is the, the, the divine name. Uh, well, so. actually, their words are usually divine names. Yeah, except the divinity just don't, don't exist. Well, they're yeah. demons. Well, they're that kind of right, good point. Uh, this, the Hindu, well, medita good, sorry. The Hindu <laughs> meditation uses the names of, of, of deities. Yes, yes, that's true. And I don't think the Buddhist Om Mani Padme Hum, which means the jewel in the heart of the lotus. Yeah. Oh, well, it's not. What is that? <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, that? I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, it's it's a beautiful concept, but. Um, but it seems to uh, appeal to the same part of the human personality with different content. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas it seems to be sort of addressing the mind and moose distinction on a practical level, but with different content than the one we put into it. Right. And focus. Well, except with the noose, there's no content. Well, there isn't the Jesus prayer. Is there isn't the Jesus prayer. But the Jesus, the Jesus prayer remains part of the rational mind. But isn't the purpose of the, the Jesus prayer to to tell, to accomplish that flip that we're talking about? Well, yeah. what the purpose of the Jesus prayer is to occupy the rational mind so that and to make space for the news to pray right, right. and to open open up the rational mind to to the atten to the uh, faculty of attention so that so that our attention can descend through the rational through the mind into the heart and and pray in silence and the heart is news the heart is the news Jesus prays like it's like the bridge that gets you right to the edge 
Yeah. It's not the only way. To, isn't there another, like, just... Well, there's other ways. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, the, but, but the idea is, I, however, how, whatever you do, the idea is to silence the rational mind, to silence the thoughts. Now, some people can do that simply by um, sitting meditation. But I think that's, I think that's a little harder. And it's, and one of the problems with that is in the Christian context is is that is that you get lost in the in the non-conceptual um, space of the, that you encounter. It seems scary. It's very scary. You're standing naked in the infinite abyss with nothing to hold on to, including any concepts. And being open to other spiritual influences coming in. <clears throat> yeah. They may not be conceptual, but they may be spiritual. Mm -hmm. That we don't want. Right. Because you can't really shut off your brain. I mean, you can't. You, you can't. No, but you go into it. It's a different, it's a, it's a different state of brain waves, actually. You go into in deep meditation, in deep contemplation. The, the brain waves shift. So, yeah. So, um, I was thinking as you were talking about hesychasm, like in the, still in the, um, when we were in the temple, and you were saying like there, there were lots of monasteries where in Russia they didn't practice it. Uh, like. For centuries. Yeah, like a lot of the different books um, that I, some, some of the different things I've read. They give like a very strong. They they make it clear that it's central to the faith, but in in a, such a way that it's almost like implying that if people don't practice this, like they're not Christian or something. Yeah, and that, that's that's wrong. Okay. And that and that they're just, they're being maximalist. They're being. They're just they're, like emphasizing it. Yeah. Like, yeah. To a large. Okay, I gotcha. They're advertising it. <laughs> okay. I'm trying. Trying to get converts. Works. So what, this is, although this is like a central, it's a central form of spirituality. It is still one form of spirituality that's uh, that you can be a Christian if you haven't, you know, engaged in. Right, but but part of it is that, especially with the Palamite controversies and the councils which would have been the Ninth Ecumenical Council, um, uh, you have the, uh, you have this um, uh, a, a canonization, actually, of uh, hesychasm. Yes. Um, as a defining mark of uh, Orthodox Christianity. That doesn't mean everybody has to practice it, but it's it certainly does become a defining mark. Gotcha. So, um, great lesson. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, but it, but it's. But it's interesting to think, of, to think about because the real goal of, of, our, of hesychasm and of the spiritual life is to get to the true self and to develop that. And for the most part, we live in a, um, we live oblivious to it. You know, people in the world live oblivious to the spiritual awareness, the spiritual awareness, in our culture especially. Or it's there, but... It, they don't know what to do with it. You were talking about breaking through, you know, mm -hmm. the ego. The, the only thing that came to mind is my own experience that it seems that that's done in community. You know, we've been saying that we're safe together. Um, oh, yeah. It's, you know, it's the constant failing that really hammers it in how, mm -hmm. how much I have to go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
in this sense, breaking through the ego doesn't, there's, there's the external aspect of it, and this is, and there's also just a purely internal aspect of it. And um, so it's all the thought elements of, of ego and all the assumptions and all of the desires and all of the passions and all of the, and all of that is what constitutes the ego. Can I throw a, a random uh -huh. thought into that, which is beauty, you know, that, that wonderful idea of beauty will save. Uh -huh. uh, I wonder just if, if it's just a, how much beauty does to destroy our ego in that, in that context. Well, yeah, because where's, uh, what is real beauty? It's noetic. Uh, Perception of beauty is noetic because it's a reflection of God. Uh, it's a spiritual, it's, it's real beauty is a, is a spiritual experience, right? I mean, that helps me understand modern art so much more. <laughs> it's just not an experience. Yeah, because God. there's no, well, there's no beauty. <laughs> right, yeah. And, and there's no beauty and there's no, and there's no spiritual content. Yeah. It, it, it says one thing. See, that, that's why people like it, really. That's the same reason people yeah. like it. Yeah. That's all of modern art right there. <laughs> well, all, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, what I'm saying, it's the conscious denial of beauty. Yeah. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a radical. Maybe some people are making money. Well, obviously, people are making money from it, but yeah. yeah. It's also they get to. There's a lot of people who don't make money on it, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but yeah, the viewers don't make money. <laughs> so the artists yeah. oftentimes don't make money. Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, for sure. Yeah, these are Yeah. Some yeah. yeah. No, nice some if you're majoring on art or whatever. Yeah, yeah, if you major in art, it's not very popular. Starving arts. Well, mm -hmm. also this with the rational mind and the noose, it reminds me very much of uh, the Savior saying, if thine eye be single, mm -hmm. thy whole body shall be full of light. Mm -hmm. um, so if the rational mind is, is allowed only to go to God, to dwell in God, then, you know, uh, uh, everything becomes, uh, well, the, the noose maybe if we're integrated, Maybe if we're integrated. Yeah, single. If, 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 we, if we live according to that original integration, then our whole body is full of light. If our noose and our rational mind are integrated. This also supports the, a, a wider view of the body because uh, you know what kind of light is not just a physical light. Right. Could you say that again? Well, when Christ said, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. And all the said, this is the eye of the heart, or this is the mind, or this is the, 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 the focus of the attention, or the... And so, uh, so like in Jesus' prayer, you're, you're, you're only allowing your mind to think one thought, and that is, Jesus have mercy. And so your mind is only allowed to think about God. And... Um, so it's going to come down to the side and the stuff just in, in the store. Um, then it opens up the news to be able to, to, to be free and uh, interact with God. And then, um, uh, then, then it says, thy whole body shall be full of light. Mm -hmm. And it's a spiritual light, so therefore, uh, the, uh, what we said about the, the flesh and the body, the, the, the body being a little bit wider definition than the flesh, mm -hmm. Uh, would apply there because uh, we're, we're talking not just about a physical life in the flesh. So, yes. does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, it makes sense. Okay. Well, so shall we.